This is the video manual for Funk by Collider Modular. Funk is a dual channel quad mode function generator for Cherry Audio's Voltage Modular. So when you first come to Funk and you're learning how to operate it, the most important thing is probably this, this area right here with the mode switch. So there's a button here inside of the rectangle and pressing it will allow advancement of each mode. There are four different modes to choose from and each mode dictates what the overall behavior of Funk is operating as. In this first mode, which looks like a triangle without a line under it, this is attack decay mode or AD. The way the AD mode works is given a trigger on the gate in port, it will produce the function on the output port. So I've connected the out port here to the oscilloscope, allow us to see what's going on. Um, we could patch a trigger, or there's also a handy button here. When you press the button, it basically simulates a trigger. And so you can see as I click that button, we are getting the function out the other end. Now, the way the AD mode works is as soon as a trigger happens, the attack or the rise portion starts. And as soon as the rise portion finishes, then the fall or decay portion begins. So you can see that every time I fire this function, it happens at a fixed duration. Now the next mode, which looks like a triangle with the top part cut off, this is attack release mode, sometimes known as attack hold release or AHR. AHR works similar to AD. The difference is that given a gate signal, so something that will remain high, the rise portion will play, the shape will remain high as long as the gate is high, and then as soon as the gate is released, we will have the decay portion. So over here, you can see I'm holding down the button and when I let go, then the decay or the fall portion begins. So already you can see that both of these will allow you to deal with either if you have a trigger, so AD mode works best with a trigger, and AHR mode works best with a gate. Now the third mode here, which is this one that looks like uh, there's lines going up and down, which is exactly what you see, this is looping mode. And in looping mode, two things change. Number one, the signal moves from being unipolar, so zero volts to five volts. It moves instead to being bipolar, so it will go from positive five volts down to negative five volts, and it will oscillate between the two. The other thing that happens is, you notice we don't need a gate signal here. Now, patching a gate signal will simply cause this to reset, and you can see if I sit it, hit it there, it will just reset its cycle. If you wanted to synchronize the looping with some external clock or signal, you could patch in a gate here and it would reset whenever it receives that. But otherwise it will just continue on as a regular LFO will. Now the last mode here is a bit of a combination of the second and third mode. And this is a gated loop mode. Gated loop mode will loop so long as the gate input is high. So you can see if I hold down the button, I'm getting a loop. And as soon as I let the button go, it will turn off. Now all of these modes seem simple, but they have quite a lot of possibility for various usage. There's one more output that I want to show you about before we move on to talking about the other Jackson knobs, and that is this one here labeled end. What end will do is as soon as the function is finished, it will fire a trigger on this jack. So for example here, you can see we're back in AD mode. I'm gonna tap it once, it will play the function through, and then at the end of the function, you can see that we get a little trigger here. Now this works in all the modes. I'm gonna do the same here in AR mode. You can see as soon as that finishes, we're gonna get a trigger. Likewise here in looping mode, we're gonna get a trigger at the end. And in gated loop, we will as well. So I'll hold that and each time a function finishes, whether it's positive or negative, we'll get a trigger. Now later on, you'll see that this actually grants a lot of interesting functionality because it allows us to chain functions together. Before we go on though, I do wanna show you Technically, there is a little bit of a fifth mode. When we were in looping mode here, you notice that we were getting this bipolar signal, so we're getting both positive and negative. It's possible to get a unipolar or rectified looping mode as well by simply patching the end trigger into the gate input. So you can see nothing's happening, but we'll give it a trigger to start the process. And the way that this works is each time the function finishes, it fires a trigger, and if we use that trigger to then re-trigger itself, well, we have now generated a unipolar looping mode. This is starting to expose that even though a function generator might be simple, 
It has a few key elements. Combining them together gives you a lot more interesting results. Let's continue on though. We've got a couple of knobs and Jack still to talk about. All right, so I've gone ahead and I've set up uh, both channels are running right now, and I didn't mention this before, but both of these channels are equivalent. So this, this yellowish one up here is the X channel, and this orangey one down here is the Y channel. I've set up both of them to be in the same configuration here, just so that you can see we're more or less getting the same thing out on both. I've synchronized them by uh, clicking a gate on, on this first one whenever this one up here was outputted. But I'm going to do this to show the difference in shape between bipolar and unipolar. So this first knob here, you can see there's a bunch of different shapes on it. As we move this knob around, it will fundamentally change the shape. And so let's just start off here at 1.0. This gives you an idea of this shape. This is kind of an inverted uh, envelope shape. Now at the very bottom here, the exponents are quite dramatic, but if we pull that, if we pull that back, it'll kind of mellow out a little bit. So there you can see what it looks like in both bipolar and unipolar. Now the third shape, is, uh, you should probably recognize this, this is the, uh, the first half of a sinusoidal. Going up to the top we have a classic triangle shape. Going over to shape number five, we have this kind of back-to-back uh, -back exponential shape. This is probably my favorite of the group. And then continuing on, we have the inverse of the shape we started with where we kind of have a, a curved rise into an exponential decay. And then we can exaggerate the exponential aspect of that shape as well, getting a lot more snap to whatever it is that we're doing. Right, so moving on, I have brought us back here to attack decay mode, and I've patched the output trigger to the gate so that we're getting a unipolar looping function. Let's talk about these other two knobs. So the one to the right of shape is called skew. And what skew will do is it will change the balance between how much of the time of the function is dedicated towards rising versus how much of the time is dedicated towards falling. So as I scrub skew over to the left, you can see that what's happening is our triangle is beginning to lean to the left. At the far extreme with the knob all the way to the left, you can see that we actually end up with a saw wave shape. And likewise, if I scrub skew to the right, our shape starts to lean off to the right, where on the extreme we end up with a ramp. Now skewing works in all of the modes, so for example we could do the back-to-back -back exponential but then start to skew it over. Do the same with a sinusoidal. It gives you an idea of skew. Uh, one of the useful things here I'll mention, a common thing that I often use, is when I'm operating Funk as an envelope, I'll set skew to zero, and I'll put the shape kind of around here, and this gives me kind of that classic envelope shape. Anyways, that's skew. Now time, time actually has two modes that it operates in, and you can see there's a little division and multiplication, we'll talk about that in a second. The thing to know about time is there's a line that connects it down here to the clock jack. If there is no clock jack connected, then time is an absolute value in milliseconds. So you can see as I bring it up, the function will get longer. This is allowing us to set a hard amount of time that this function will execute. So at the extreme left, it will be 10 milliseconds, and at the extreme right, it will be three seconds for an entire cycle. Now, there's another way that we can use time, and that is if we connect a clock. So let me go ahead and wire that up. Off on the left here, you can see that I have a sync generator and a sync divider. So I'm going to take the clock out from the sync divider, and I'm going to patch that to the clock jack. Now, what this will do is it will take it a couple cycles to balance out with that digital clock signal, but you can see as soon as it does, we are going to get a nice, evenly uh, distributed function happening. What happens with the time knob now is that it changes function a little bit. And you can see as I mouse over it, you can see the tooltip there says one. So with a clock connected, the function of time changes to be a multiplier or a divider of the base clock signal. So with the time knob straight up and down, whatever the duration of our clock pulse is will become the duration of the function. And skew will define how much attack or decay happens for that function. This is basically a clock-synced LFO at this point. 
However, as we scrub time to the left, you'll see with the tooltip there, what happens is we start dividing it down. So we start getting divisions of our clock signal. This function is now looping at twice the frequency of our clock. And this can keep going down all the way to divided by 16. So in this case, we're actually getting a 16th of the duration of our clock signal. You can bring that back up to something slightly more sane. Now, likewise, the same thing works on the right hand. We can start to multiply it. So multiplying it will basically give us two times the clock duration. So if our clock is at this point firing at quarter notes, this is basically giving us a half note synced function. And likewise, this will go again all the way up into 16, which is huge and large. And I'm going to crank this all the way up. If you give it a very slow clock signal, you can get a very slow function out the other end. You can see here as the clock stabilizes on this new slow value, we're starting to get a very slow function out the other end. Now I have mentioned this a couple of times. The way that Funk treats clocks is it will average the duration of the clock pulses to try to get the most precise signal as possible. The slight downside to this is it'll take it a couple of clock cycles before it gets a stable signal. That's the way that most digital clocks work, and the advantage is that you get a pretty accurate clock after you've had a few cycles to average it out. All right, so resetting back to a unipolar looping triangle function. There's two last things to talk about, and that is the shape and the time jack. Now these work as you would expect. You can patch a control voltage signal in here, which can be attenuated by either of these knobs, and that will modulate the shape and the time. So let's go ahead and give that a try. Now one of the things I'm going to do is we've been using this X channel up here. I'm going to use the second channel to modulate the first. So I'm going to put this in looping mode. I'm going to take the output here and pass it into the shape. And you know what? I'll, I'll put this on the scope so we can see it. And then I'm going to add some attenuation value here to let that change the shape. And that works like you would expect. Now, one tip that I have found as I have been developing Funk is that it helps if the modulator is running at a the same or a division or multiplication of the same frequency as your base function. Given what you know so far, you probably know there's a way we can do that, which is if we patch the end trigger of this function to the clock trigger of this one down here, what will happen is we will actually synchronize this function to be oscillating at the same frequency as this one up here. And as soon as we do that, you notice that we can start to get much more stable shapes out the top up here. Adjusting the division will allow us to adjust how frequently those shapes change. So you can see here every four cycles, we are getting a different shape, and that's because our time here is set to a multiplier of three. We can do the same thing with time. So you can see here I've patched the output of the X function here, and we'll give that a little bit of attenuation. And you can see that when we do that, it really starts jumping all over the place. Now, one of the things that happens, an interesting uh, side product of this, let me zoom in so we can actually see that, is you can see down here this trigger output. We start to get these bursts. As the modulation changes our time to be very little, it causes the functions to sort of fire at a very rapid pace. And if you watch up here, you can just see it, it kind of sputters out. We'll zoom out here on the scope. This long line here is just a, a sputter, a burst of triggers. Now, this can be an interesting function in its own right. So in addition to getting this crazy weird modulation out the top, which can be fun for all different types of uses, we also get a burst of triggers that we could likewise use to trigger a whole bunch of other weird things in our system as well. All right, so resetting the module back to its uh, starting state, let's talk about the last two areas, and that is the blend area down here and the stereo VCA area here. So I'm going to patch uh, both the X and the Y channel just to make them visible. I'll start them off. We will let that synchronize. So now these are oscillating on the same frequency, and we could make ch any changes that we want. So I'll, I'll shift the shapes around here a little bit. So let's talk about this blend area. So with these two going, what blend does is blend will give you the the or, or a blend of both of these channels. So right now with a blend, with this knob perfectly up and down, it will be a 50-50 split. So if we take a look at this on the scope, you can see that sure enough, 
we're going from this back-to-back -back exponential and sinusoidal shape into this kind of smooth triangular shape. You can see it's got a little bit of bends. As we move the blend knob to the left, we get more of the X channel. And as we move the blend knob to the right, we get more of the Y channel. At the extreme left, we get all X. And at the extreme right, we get all Y. So that works as you might expect. Um, as you start to change things around and skew these and make them a little bit different than each other, this blend output can really start to produce some interesting results. And you can see here, just watching down here, already we're getting much more interesting results than we were before. This can be used to create all sorts of kind of bizarre things. And one of the things I like to do is use the X and the Y channel for a, for a quote normal usage and then take the blend out as just sort of a, a gravy byproduct of that. Now there's another knob here in the blend area and that is mutate. Mutate has a different function whether we turn it to the left or to the right. So watch carefully on the blue line down here. As mutate turns to the left, what we start to do is we introduce stepping to the blended signal. So you can see there, we're getting more and more stepped. The more that we turn mutate to the left, the more coarse the blend signal becomes. And at the extreme, we get a very stepped signal. You could feed this into a quantizer or an oscillator and produce some strange effects or intentionally get really steppy by feeding this into some type of modulation source. Now, mutate also has a different function when we turn it to the right. It will smoothly blend between rectified, inverted, and inverted rectified. So you can see down here, at the extreme right, we're getting inverted rectified. And in the middle here, about seven, we'll start to get like a rectified signal maybe. You can see that what it's doing ultimately is it's attenuating the blended output and it's either changing whether it is in the positive domain or the negative domain. One of the things that I will mention here that is a good usage of this blend area is when I was developing this and I had asked for feedback, somebody had asked for an ability to get a negative signal out. And there's an easy way to do that with mutate. If you set mutate all the way to the right and you set the blend knob to either all the way to the right for the Y channel or all the way to the left for the X channel, then you will get a negative version of whatever the channel is. So in this case, you can see I've set it to the far right, so we're getting the Y channel. And while the Y channel is typically a bipolar signal, you can see we're getting a bipolar signal, the actual output here, what we're getting is an inverted rectification. So instead of it alternating into the positive and negative domain at the far right, you can see we're getting all negative domain. Now, this can be useful if you are used to using, for example, the negative output on an envelope to do some kind of filter modulation. You can basically get the same effect by setting blend to either max of the channel you want and mutate all the way to the far right. So the last major feature of funk is this area down here, which is the stereo VCA. This works much like you would expect. We can take any signal. So here I have an oscillator. I'm going to take the triangle signal and I'll patch it into X. And the way that this works is this upper function is the X channel. And whatever the shape of the upper function is will be applied to modulate the amplitude of this particular signal coming in. So if I take the VCA out and patch that in for us to listen to, you can hear now that that shape is effectively modulating that sound. Now a feature here, if there's nothing patched into the Y channel, the value of whatever is patched into the X will be normaled over to the Y. The output of the Y channel will be modulated by the second function. So if we start this up, patch this in, you can now hear that we're creating a bit of a stereo field here with this. And anything that we change or modify here will just further enhance that. Lots of interesting possibilities here. So one last thing I want to call out, and this isn't particularly a feature that is unique to funk, but it is something that, that works pretty well in funk, and that is randomization. 
So randomization will modify the shape, skew, time, and attenuation, but it will leave mode alone. So here you can see on both the X and the Y channel, I have set it in looping mode. We can right click randomize control. If you're on Windows, you can do control R, and if you're on Mac, you can do command R. And you'll see that what happens is it'll keep you in the mode that you have left it in, but it will simply change the values to a different set. Now this can be something useful while you are doing a patch. If you like to record yourself or, or perform in a more live recorded sense, then if you want something new, something totally random, you can just select the module, hit Control R and get a completely different modulation out the other end for a potentially completely different sound. Resetting, of course, will change everything and that will bring you back to Attack Decay mode. So now let's do a couple of examples and I wanna start out with probably what is my favorite and that is function chaining. So if you think about what a function is, it's basically a rise phase followed by a fall phase and then a trigger at the end. Now we can use that simplicity to our advantage. So here you can see if I, if I tap it, you've already seen this, we can play a function. Well, what happens if we use the end trigger of that function? to then trigger another function. So if I tap that, you can see that we now get two functions, one right after the other. If we were to take the output of those and we were to add them into a mixer and look at the output, you can see that down here on the purple line, we are seeing those two functions back to back. Any changes that we make, so I might modify the shape and the time, maybe I'll make that one short and skew it over a little bit. Any of those functions that we make then apply and we can start to create very complex modulation down here. And there's really no limit to how many that you can patch together. So I could take the ending gate of this second function and patch that to the gate in of the third function, the ending gate of the third function to the input gate of the fourth function. Modify these parameters a little bit, give us something different. And there you can see in doing that, oh, I forgot to add it to the mix output. But there you can see in doing that, we can start to build up these really complex modulation chains. This is starting to become kind of interesting altogether. Now, if we wanted this to loop, all we would need to do is pass the trigger of the last function to the gate of the first function, and it will permanently loop for us. All right, so that's pretty neat. And what we can do is we can start to take that value and we can apply it to something else. So I have an audio signal kind of already running here, which doesn't sound amazing. But we can take the output of this modulation and patch that to control the frequency. Let's play around with some of the parameters here. starting to sound interesting, we could add, we could add maybe some reverb and delay to this, and it'll really start to pop. So I'm going to patch the output of the filter I was using there into this VST host, and then we'll use, we'll use spaced out. You can see that because we made these two inner functions very short, we get that kind of voila in the middle to add some interest. Now another interesting thing that we could do to add some more variety here is that we could add another function generator. And this function generator could modulate the parameters of this other one up here. So I'm gonna put this into looping mode. And let's change the shape. I'm gonna make this one kind of slow. And we'll make this one kind of, we'll leave this one fast.
right, so you get the idea. Lots of fun to be had there. Another use for funk is that it can act as both a clock-synced envelope or a clock-synced LFO. Now, not everybody likes clock-synced LFOs, but I do. And one of the advantages of a clock-synced LFO is that you can use the fact that, it, that the oscillations of the LFO line up exactly on beat to create a rhythmic pattern that otherwise wouldn't be there. So here I have some modules out for a basic patch. I have a sync generator over here. This will be our master clock. And I'm going to patch the master clock to our step sequencer. And then I'll patch the master clock also to our two functions. All right, so let's just get this set up here. Now, as for the step sequencer, I'm going to take the trigger output of that, and I'm going to patch that into the gate input of our first function. So we'll treat this one as an envelope generator. So I'll skew it over to the left there. And then I will take the CV output and, of course, patch that into our oscillator, oscillator into the filter, filter into the VCA of funk, and then funk out for us to listen to. I'll just throw some steps out here randomly. Well, we might certainly need some more time than that. second function is also clock sync we could put this into looping mode Oops. and we could make this maybe a multiplier of our clock so I'm gonna I'm gonna set this at four times the clock signal and we can use this to change the frequency over time now the reason that I picked four here is because we're using the eight step sequencer and so that means that we can basically every four steps that there's already a pattern of eight steps and so by setting this to a clock division of four, it means that we'll get two cycles of this every time the sequencer runs all the way through. So anything we do will be rhythmically related to what the sequencer is doing. So if we take the output here of the LFO, I'm gonna patch that into the frequency modulation. And there you can hear we have a rhythmic pattern because this function this is oscillating at a synchronized rate of our sequencer. And any, mod, 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 uh, any modulations or modifications that we make to this will then be reflected in our pattern. Right, so as we do this, we start to get a little bit more of that bounce. responds to the dee 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 dee. We're almost creating a call and response simply by using synchronized modulation. All right, so that gives you another idea of something that I find really useful with a function generator. So for our last use here, let's use funk for maybe something slightly less traditional. So in this case, we can think about each function not just being an output of shape, but also being an output of trigger. So what I've done here is for each of the out and the trigger, I've wired them in. So you can see up here in the red and green, we have the shape, but down here in the blue and orange, we have when the trigger is firing. Now we could use these triggers to then fire off some sort of percussive sound. So for example, I'm gonna patch the X channel here to these hi-hats, and I'm gonna patch the Y channel to the cowbell. 
Now, you notice probably right away that while they're running at the same uh, duration, they have the same amount of time between beats, they're slightly misaligned. Now, we could use this to our advantage to intentionally create some weird shift. You can change the difference in time by simply re-triggering one or two of these. So for example, if I re-trigger the cowbell, we're changing the, the, the time difference there between them. If we wanted them to be synchronized, an easy way is simply just to take the output of one function, to patch it into the gate of another function, and then to release it. The reason why you don't need to keep it there is because once you patch it in, it will restart the cycle on the bottom at that same frequency, and then you can, you can take it off. It doesn't need to stay. So they're out of time. I'm gonna patch a gate in. Now they're in time. You can see down here, sure enough, the, the triggers are lining up. So we can use uh, interesting aspects of this to change the time relationship to each other. So for example, I will leave the cowbells going at their rate and I will patch the, this is the shape output of the cowbell and I'm gonna patch that into time modulation of the hats. You can see we're starting to create drum grooves using just two functions. idea that not only can funk be used as a means to generate shapes, which is interesting, it can also be a means to generate triggers and bursts or gaps of triggers as well. Now we could take this idea and we could keep delivering it more, potentially with a sequential switch to trigger other instruments, and we could build up an entire uh, percussive band drum set by just using a couple of outputs on funk. Anyways, I hope that that has expanded the horizons of what you are now aware of that you can do with a function generator. There's a ton of more things to explore. Funk and function generators in general are really about taking simple components and thinking of interesting ways to combine them. I hope that you have a lot of fun playing around with this and make the music that you're after. Enjoy. <laughs>